I was recently asked by a friend who has a uh, small collection of historical firearms to uh, help him set up a, a display of a couple of the pieces in an office. It would be a combination of a gun safe, but one that could still be displayed like in a conventional shadow box and still be uh, resistant to casual theft. Uh, and um, I thought about it a little while and the approach I came up with I decided to document in case it would benefit anybody else with a similar situation. Now here's the wall in question where it's going to go. Uh, it's near a door frame and there's a, a wall switch and a fan uh, control here which I've taken the cover off of. And I probed around in the wall and found out there's a stud about here and it's approximately 16 inches to a stud that runs over here, just about the normal spacing. Uh, and uh, there's a conduit that runs up here, which probably compl complicates this a little bit compared to what you might find in a more open section of wall. But I'm trying to accommodate that here. Uh, so uh, the first thing I had to start out with was to uh, figure out how to do this in a way that would be secure and my approach was to get a heavy piece of sheet metal and put it inside the hole that's going to be cut into the drywall and bolt the sheet metal between the two studs and then bolt the shadow box to that sheet metal and then mount the uh, trigger locks for the guns onto the sheet metal through the back of the box. So you can't get at any of the hardware to release it without undoing the locks. And uh, even if you tried to come through the back of the wall, you'd encounter, your, encounter this heavy piece of sheet metal, which would block access from the rear. So it seems like a fairly simple and straightforward way of doing this with still pretty good security. And uh, we'll see how it goes. I found a uh, fairly basic picture frame in the local craft store that's about the right size for displaying the two firearms and uh, if my camera will get busy in focus here there we go um, it's about the right size assuming we go between the stud and the other stud it's about the right width it's got a good uh, height to width ratio and a fairly plain uh, frame of course just about any frame from a very uh, highly decorative one to a very basic one would work with the concept I'm proposing. Now even though the uh, idea here is to have a built into the wall shadow box which doubles as a gun safe uh, and the frame itself is just a cover almost like the mirror on the front of an in-wall medicine cabinet um, if somebody were to break into the guy's house and uh, assume that the cover didn't open and just tried to shatter the glass to get at the firearms. Uh, I didn't want it to be that easily broken just to avoid a mess. So I got the craft shop to make a piece of custom cut uh, acrylic. Uh, I don't know if this is plexiglass, Lexan, whatever it is, but it's a uh, quote unquote framing grade clear acrylic material which can go in in place of the normal glass. Of course now it's got the protective paper on it, but um, I thought this would be an important step. Again, this doesn't actually add any security, it's just there to uh, make a more robust frame. A key component to this concept is an appropriate lockable wall mount trigger lock. And um, <clears throat> I selected this one made by Franzen Security Products. It's their combination wall mount trigger lock. It's a universal design that should fit the trigger guard of pretty much any uh, gun. And it actually does come with an extra bracket if you're going to uh, wall mount a rifle with it. But in the case of a handgun, uh, it works all by itself. Now this consists of several pieces. First off, it has the base unit which mounts to the wall with two large screws. Now I'm going to be going into the sheet metal backing plate so I'm going to replace these screws with some machine screws. Anyway the screws are not accessible 
when the lock is assembled so you have to be able to open the lock to get at the screws to remove it and thereby undo the assembly from the wall um, and then you've got the the intermediate part of the lock which you can see here has a small hole and this is all metal and it anchors into this middle hole with a uh, machine screw like this and thereby sits into it like this on the wall. Now I'm going to open this up. Once the proper combination is entered the uh, middle part of the lock swivels down and then let's see if I can do this with one hand Of course, it's hard to do with one hand. Anyway, the, the front part of the lock then comes off of the back part of the lock. This should go on there. You can kind of see in here that there is this ratchet inside the intermediate part of the lock, and that matches up with um, another ratchet on the front part of the lock. When you actually open the lock and swivel the front, it rotates that ratchet post to the side so it no, long, no longer engages with the ratchet on the middle part and it can pull out. Um, and this uh, tube here is the part that screws into the, um, the back of the back section of the lock. So uh, once again, this would be all bolted together and on the wall and then you put the gun on there and then you stick this piece through the trigger guard into the middle hole and swing the front part of the lock around and it holds the gun to the wall. Another important part of this is that your normal USA style uh, framed wall which uses 2x4 studs and a drywall on the front and rear. If you cut through the drywall on one surface, you end up with almost exactly four inches from the inner edge uh, or the inner side of the back piece of drywall through the two by fours to the front face of the front piece of drywall. So you get four inches of effective depth there to work with. And with your typical uh, handgun bolted into this particular lock, the distance from this point to the uh, very front of the lock is about three and five eighths inches. So I'm figuring, say, a eighth inch thick piece of sheet metal for the security bracket, plus maybe uh, an eighth of an inch thick piece of wood uh, in front of that for decorative purposes. And uh, you're going to have this front piece fairly close to the back of the picture frame on the wall, but there's still a bit of clearance there. So it should all fit. For the uh, backing metal piece, um, I used um, eighth inch thick plain steel, um, about almost 16 inches from here to here, or not 16 inches, but the uh, dimension from this side to this side is about uh, three-eighths of an inch less than the diff the distance between the two studs that this is going between and uh, <clears throat> it's made a little taller than it probably needs to be and I may have to cut some off this depends on fit this was actually made before the picture frame was selected and you can see the way it's folded up here now I don't have facility to do this myself but there's a company I uh, work with online, I'll post it here on the video, that will make uh, custom sheet metal brackets and plates and shapes that you just uh, design and order online and they ship it to you. And uh, this, wor this works really well. You don't need to go find a, a local job shop. You can just order it online and get it pretty quickly. Um, anyway, the idea by making this a little bit narrower from here to here was that um, in my case the uh, the installation where this is going there's that conduit on the right 
so the hole in the drywall can't be as wide as the space between the two studs. And this is going to have to go in at a slight angle and be rotated in. I'm really not sure how that's going to work out. Um, there was just too many things I had to design without actually being at the, uh, the home where this is going to be installed. And so I'm kind of winging it and there may be some uh, last minute improvisations necessary. So again this is going to be a shadow box, uh, albeit a recessed one. Instead of being mounted on the surface of the wall, it'll be recessed into the wall. Um, and I stopped by the local uh, home improvement store and picked up a piece of what they like to call the select pine, meaning there's no big knots in it and it's relatively straight and clean cut. Almost all these have a little warp to them, but I selected a piece that was pretty clean and straight, so this will be used to make the the four sides of the shadow box. And uh, in my home shop I had some leftover um, material for making another set of shadow boxes for my own house. And uh, this is just some masonite that has a, a kind of a plasticky laminated uh, textured surface on one side which is nice for making cabinets. And uh, since the, the home this is going into is requested that the whole box be white except for the picture frame, this will save having to paint this one surface. So this seems like a, an appropriate material to use for the back of the shadow box. Uh, this uh, piece of pine is just about exactly three quarters of an inch thick and really there's no need to use a piece of pine like this it's just that's what I decided to use uh, the way I'm gonna do this a piece of uh, half inch or three quarter plywood would work just about as well for making the shadow box assuming it's got at least one good side on it but uh, this was actually less expensive than buying even a half sheet of uh, one good side plywood so I went this route okay so how big should the actual shadow box be I don't want any part of the shadow box to actually intrude into the visible part of the frame so it should be outside of this part here but probably not by too much I'd like to have more overhang on the frame going outside of the shadow box to facilitate putting a hinge and other things on it so I don't want the box to be like way over here I'd like it to be closer this way as far as the width of the uh, the box itself I know that my shadow box material is three quarters of an inch and uh, this seems to leave a lot of room on the width of this frame which is uh, just about well, there's a little parallax here, but it looks like it's about one and seven eighths of an inch looking straight down on it. Now the actual hinges to hinge the frame aside uh, are an important part of this, so I need to integrate their dimensions into the overall plan. And I bought these uh, so-called desk hinges. They're brass, but all they have to do is hold the weight of the frame. There's no uh, value to these hinges as far as the uh, safety aspect of the um, the whole assembly it's just there to hold the uh, the frame itself so they don't need to be heavyweight steel or anything I'm going to open up this packet so here's the uh, the frame with the hinge mounted on it I'm going to go with the uh, edge of the frame and the edge of the hinge being flush Therefore, when the hinges open like this, the frame ought to be able to go at least 90 degrees out from the wall before any part of the frame hits the wall. And the uh, hinge is going to need to be countersunk into the frame. I have to hog that out with a Dremel or something or a chisel. Um, anyway, so this is the width of the hinge, and that leaves me less than three-quarters of an inch um, in from the edge of the frame 
so I'm going to need to make some adjustment here. <clears throat> so a bit more thinking. Here's a, sort of a top view. This is a wall stud. This is the side of the shadow box. Think three quarter inch thick. Here's the drywall which overhangs the stud slightly and that's going to be because I've got that sheet metal bracket ultimately in here that is going to go like this that has to fit up against the stud and then the the box will be here with its backing piece this is the back of the box here uh, and then the side of the shadow box uh, so the cutout in the drywall will be slightly in from uh, the stud just to allow for the thickness of the metal plate and uh, the my intention is to only have the front of the shadow box come flush with the drywall so the hinge can actually overhang the gap a little bit uh, so it's not that big a deal um, if it does but I think that I may since I have the option here in my shop, I'm going to probably take this side piece down in my uh, planer to make it a thinner piece of wood. I could also use the bandsaw and recut this board um, here to make it thinner. That'll just give me some more leeway. Um, for simplicity, I may leave the other sides alone. Or I could have just bought half inch wood. But uh, in any case, uh, the picture frame with its cutout which is simplified in this view this edge here would be this edge here um, overhanging ever so slightly the shadow box and then the hinge going here uh, the hinge would overhang the gap a little bit I think that'll be fine it's all going to be hidden by the frame anyway except when it's opened so I'm going to lay out the shadow box like this I'm going to have the sides butt into the top and bottoms. I think it'll look slightly better. And um, I've measured on the frame that I need a 13 and 3 quarter inch inner dimension of the uh, vertical inside of the box and a 10 and 3 quarter inch of the inner dimension on the horizontal side here. Uh, now, uh, with the outer parts being three quarters of an inch, that adds an inch and a half. And I'm going to make the sides um, half an inch or maybe five eighths of an inch just to get a little more clearance with the hinge on the side. So I've decided to go with five eighths on the side pieces and uh, keep the top and bottom three quarters just so there's less to trim down. Once again, uh, this isn't probably going to be quite so particular on other installations but it's the way this particular one worked out anyway I figured that the uh, total height is going to be 15 and a quarter my side pieces need to be 13 and 3 quarter inch long the top, top and bottom piece need to be uh, 12 inches long to pick up the 10 and 3 quarter plus the two 5 8 inch pieces on the other side so time to start cutting wood Okay, I've got my two side pieces and my top and bottom pieces. Now these are still, uh, I don't know, something, uh, what are they? They're uh, considerably wider than they need to be. They're about uh, five and a half inches wide. They're going to have to be trimmed down to something a bit shy of four inches. But I'm not going to do that yet um, because I'm not sure exactly how it's going to work out once it's mounted in the wall and I want to get the metal plate mounted and test fit this before I make the final decision on how wide to make these. I get it right down so it's a, a very smooth uh, flush fit with the uh, front of the drywall once it's recessed. So I'm going to build the box up uh, temporarily here uh, so that I can test fit it on the wall.
so here's the roughed out box and it's the requisite 12 inches by I can get the tape measure to cooperate and the desired 15 and a quarter outside dimension and 13 three quarter inside dimension on the vertical so here's the rough assembled box held together with a couple of countersunk screws on each face and I'm just checking it for square here and it's pretty darn close good enough for government work I have uh, marked it for approximately where it's going to get cut off to be four inches so the screws are appropriately appropriately positioned so they're not going to be in that cutoff area. So the uh, shadow boxes set up here on the wall just to check positioning. I've got a couple of marks on the left showing where the stud should be and I've marked the uh, outline of the box on the wall. I'm going to proceed cautiously here to start cutting because I don't know exactly what I'm going to find there. I'm going to use a similar tool to what I've used before to cut into drywall. Just this little uh, plunge saw with uh, various uh, blades I can cut uh, coarser or finer. Okay, after a test hole, it's clear that the stud is just a little bit further to the right than I thought it was, so I'm going to have to remark the, uh, the box boundaries. So there's the revised cut line to the right of the original one, and that takes into account the actual stud location as marked, and then an eighth of an inch over to allow for the offset due to the metal plate. Naturally, in some houses, you just don't know what you're going to find, and in this case, somebody nailed a, <coughs> a board inconveniently through the space we're going to be putting the box in, so that board's going to have to come out. I can't see any reason why the board is there. It doesn't seem to be particularly structural. It might be to help support the uh, conduit that's back here. That's about all I can think about. There is a, uh, the conduit does bend up there, so this may be something to help anchor it just before it bends. I might uh, try to cut some of that out while leaving the rest. Well, it turns out that there is a uh, wall that goes straight out from this point, and uh, that crossboard was there to help anchor um, uh, some of the uh, nails coming in from the wall there but uh, there's other ones higher and lower so I'm not going to worry too much about missing one of them I just need to grind off these uh, nails sticking out now so they don't get in the way I've got two over there and these and these All right. Those nails are trimmed off. Now I can move on. Here's the shadow box test fit. Test fit into the wall. I didn't get the uh, drywall cut out. Uh, one eighth of an inch from the stud like I intended. It came closer to the stud so I had to uh, shift over yet another eighth of an inch to make sure there was room between the stud and the shadow box. That's why there's this uh, gap of about one eighth of an inch there but otherwise the box is fitting in there pretty well. Next thing I do is to try to fit the metal plate in. Well as I mentioned before I'd ordered the metal plate before I'd picked out the frame so I was unsure of the exact dimensions. I made it a little larger than necessary. 
So here's the size of my cutout, and uh, I'm going to have to trim some off the plate in order to get it to fit through the hole. So I've marked approximately where I think it needs to go. So I have to take this home now and <laughs> cut it off. I wish I had tools at this location. I'm trying to strike a balance between showing too much of the nitty gritty details and showing enough to be cautionary to other people who might want to do this. Just some of the lessons I learned both with this uh, process specifically and with general uh, in, in, and in regards to general cutting into walls for shadow boxes and things like that. So I've made a uh, cut mark on my metal bracket and I've got a uh, cutoff wheel in my Dremel saw max. So I'm going to chop that off. Okay, so that's been cut off. Went through two grinding wheels on that. Probably could have used the band saw. I don't think it would have been any faster. I'm concerned about dropping this plate inside the wall uh, when I'm maneuvering it around. So I've drilled and tapped a hole and put a bolt in there. And uh, hopefully that'll give me something to grip it on, uh, an extra way to grip it as I'm maneuvering it so it won't fall. We'll see. So this is another problem that I'm having in this installation that you probably wouldn't have in most situations. And it's the complication of having that conduit in the way and that's forcing me to have a, a narrower hole than I'd like and uh, also the studs were slightly closer together than I'd originally measured when I couldn't see inside the wall so uh, the flange on the right side no matter how I work it doesn't quite go in there the bracket is really just about exactly the right width to go between the studs and having to fish it in here at an angle isn't quite making it. Um, I think I may try to I don't really want to cut anything off of there. Um, I may have to cut a little bit off the flange to make it slip in a little easier. I might be able to bend it slightly but eighth inch steel is pretty stiff. I'll have to go back to the shop again and see what can be done about this. I think a lot of trips back and forth are coming. All right, I've managed to bend the right flange inwards a little bit, which can help slightly. And uh, I don't want to make an extra trip more than I need to, so I think while I'm here, I'm going to take off just a little bit of the flange. It's going to be behind the conduit anyway, so. I think I'll do that to save one trip. Well, at least it goes in a little further now, but it still is binding near the top, which means that the studs aren't completely parallel, and uh, there's nothing much I can do with the bracket at this point, so I think I'm going to retrieve my Dremel tool from the trunk, put a milling bit in it, and just hog out a little bit of the stud on that side doesn't take much, maybe a sixteenth of an inch right where the flange goes and that should make the difference. While I'm at the shop I put in uh, four holes in the flanges of the metal bracket. Uh, the ones on the short flange will be uh, several inches away from the shadow box so they don't need to be countersunk but the ones on the long flange did require countersinking so that the uh, flathead wood screw would go in there without hitting the uh, side of the shadow box. Alright, so finally, let's see if I can get this to be more diffuse. Finally, after, what was it, four or five trips back and forth between the two houses, I was able to get enough wood hogged out and some adjustments to the bracket to allow it to fit in there with a bit of tapping. At this point I don't plan to take it back out again. Um, I'm going to drill the holes and put in the screws to mount it in there and then uh, start adjusting the shadow box to fit.
Okay, so the plate is finally in there. This was a part I knew was going to be a pain, and it was a pain. This all would have gone so much better, except for a couple complicating factors in this particular installation. But now it's there, and hopefully this will be a lot smoother from this point out. Okay, so the shadow box fits in the hole. There's a lot more slop on the left side that I'd kind of cut it out at an angle to help swing the plate in. It's a lot better on the right side, but there's going to have to be some sort of a trim strip around there to cover that up. It's too ugly right now. Anyway, the next thing to do is to put the back on the shadow box and uh, then bring it here and trim it for depth. Okay, I've cut a piece of the masonite with the white finish on it. I really just did this because a piece of plywood would have been more work to sand down smooth. And I had this laying around. It'll work pretty well. So I lay this on the back. This will still get trimmed, but I am, right now I'm just trying to get an accurate depth measurement. I'm going back tomorrow to finish the uh, fitting of this and then hopefully there won't be that many more trips, but I've said that before. Alright, all the boards making up the sides of the shadow box have been cut to their uh, shallower profile now to fit the depth of the wall. Okay, the box is reassembled and uh, I put a bit of glue in the corners before putting the screws in and now for putting the back on. Alright, woodworking is basically done. I've got the box sanded and ready for painting. I've got the back plate drilled and ready to go on after the painting is done. I don't uh, think I need to repaint this um, part that's already white unless the colors don't match up. I might give it a light coat for color matching. I've got the uh, back of the backboard countersunk for the screws and uh, I've got a self-priming rust-oleum paint for wood. That's a flat white. Um, I probably should have gone with a semi-gloss but they didn't have it in stock so my friend only w said he wants it white so I think his walls are white and probably flat white so I'll go with that. That's two coats and I'll probably put another couple light coats on each one just a few minutes apart per the instructions. <clears throat> so I've got the pieces here at my house now and setting up the layout that was desired figuring out exactly where the trigger locks need to be mounted on the back plate. They'll actually be mounted on the, the steel plate behind the back plate, but uh, this is the one I'm going to mark right now. So I used the provided wood screws through here and just ran them with a drill a little bit uh, to mark the positions where the holes will have to be drilled. Right now I'm just going to drill small holes there and then once the box gets put in the wall and up against the metal plate then I'll drill through the small holes to mark the metal plate and uh, drill them larger, tap them, and then put the box back in and put the real uh, sheet metal, or not sheet metal, but uh, machine screws through, which will go through here and into the um, metal plate, and that will anchor the whole box to the wall and the plate. Okay, so the box has about five coats of paint on it now, and... Uh, as soon as this uh, dries for about an hour, I'm going to put the back on 
and then it's time to do the final fitting to the uh, metal plate in the wall. I decided to add four more holes fairly close to the corners uh, for a small screw to go through into the metal plate uh, because uh, we've decided to try spackling the gap between the shadow box and the drywall cutout and we want the shadow box to be as stable and un unshifting as possible so we thought that only these two holes here and these two for the trigger locks being the only thing that's holding the shadow box in might not be adequate so we decided to add those four holes to anchor it a little more firmly to the uh, metal plate. But otherwise, uh, this is ready to have the back put onto the freshly painted shadow box. All right, the back's on the box. And it looks pretty, pretty white. The plastic back uh, plastic face of the backing seems to match the painted sides reasonably well it's not precisely the same shade of white but it's pretty close it certainly won't stand out as being a mismatch okay now back into the car and go see if it fits in the other house Okay, except for the gap we already knew about, the flushness is very good all the way around. So there's no issues with the dimensions of the box. It's time to drill through the four holes in the corners and the two holes for the trigger locks, then remove the box and tap the screws in the metal plate. All right, the pilot holes are drilled. Now I'm going to open them up and tap them. Okay, the holes are all drilled and tapped. Now one thing that's important to mention about this is I'm drilling and tapping into the backing drywall so it's always important with this kind of thing to make sure that the drill is depth limited so you don't go too far and poke through the drywall on the other side. Uh, and the tapping, of course, all the screws I've got are slightly longer than necessary to go through the metal plate, so there needs to be at least a little bit cutting into the, or drilling into the drywall to have a space for that stub to go through, but it shouldn't be very much. So one of the lock bases is mounted through the back of the shadow box and into the steel plate. And uh, here's the other one um, with the machine screws, flathead machine screws. Um, see if I can juggle the camera here. Uh, these are um, quarter 20 thread. Seem like a good choice, and it's the right diameter um, for the holes that are already in the lock base. Another thing that's important to uh, point out at this stage is the intermediate part of the lock mounts to the lock base uh, using a screw that goes through this middle hole and goes into a nut which is held captive. Uh, to make sure it didn't fall out during my manipulations, I put a piece of tape over it which will be hidden by the lock. It's probably a good idea. Okay, so both lock bases are in here. You'll notice they're offset a little bit horizontally. That was what was felt best for the proper orientation of the two guns that'll be held in here. Next thing to do is put on the middle part of the lock. Middle part of the lock looks like this. It's a metal piece with a recess in it and then there is an Allen head screw that goes through that and back into the base and into the nut which is held captive in there. 
So now the middle part of the locks are bolted onto the base part of the locks. And they are totally sturdy there, they're not going anywhere. Okay, <clears throat> this is with the two pistols test mounted on their holders. And there's a little bit of slop there, but they can't come out. The only way to do it is to um, dial in the combination, which I'm not going to show here. And then with the ah, two hand job, with the uh, combination done, then the front part of the lock comes off and the gun just comes off. Now for the uh, spackling and uh, a little bit of touch-up paint, a couple places where the drill nudged the painted surface. <clears throat> All right, so the spackling is done now, and uh, just with the unpainted spackling, it's not too horrible. The frame's going to cover that up. I'm not going to worry about painting this because then it'd be a number one, it's not my house, and number two, uh, I don't want to have to paint the whole room. It's not part of my job here, so um, I think that this is going to give a presentable look when the covers or the frame is open, and if they want to paint the whole room, they can to uh, cover up the blemishes here. So now to work on the frame. So here I am with the frame and the hinges. And I'm trying to figure out the best way to uh, assemble the hinges onto the frame to get the best result. Uh, nominally, this plate here is going to lay right on the drywall and screws are going to go through the drywall and into the stud so it has a reasonable anchor and uh, then this other plate here is going to screw into the frame. As I showed here with the red being the frame, um, I think I'm going to have to countersink this plate here into the frame somewhat in order to get the frame as close to the wall as possible, but I don't think I can countersink it more than the front of this back plate. <clears throat> the reason for that is that when the hinge swings open, um, the surface that was right here is now going to be sticking straight out on this plane, which is parallel to the wall. So the edge of the frame <clears throat> is going to hit the wall right at this point. Um, but uh, otherwise, I think that'll work. Now, if I wanted the door to swing, or the frame to swing more than 90 degrees open, then I could um, arrange it so that the pivot part of the hinge sticks out from the edge of the uh, frame a little bit, but I think that's going to be kind of ugly, so I think simply having the door open at 90 degrees from the wall should be adequate to get in there and mount the guns on the trigger locks or remove them. Okay, the spackling has been sanded and it's time for just a little touch-up paint which I've agreed to do myself uh, even though I wasn't going to. We'll see how that matches up. Alright, well that's after doing a little touch-up paint in the area It'll darken a little bit as it dries, but it's still going to be lighter. I think it's going to stand out more than it did before with just the spackling. But again, not my house, not my worry. We tried. So I've decided to try a different hinge. Um, originally I was going to use this kind of hinge, which I think looks better, but it didn't have the right dimensions to actually span the gap. I'd laid out a scale drawing here showing the half inch side of my shadow box and then a sort of a unspecified area of about half inch wide that's 
uh, kind of rough and mostly filled up with spackling. I can't anchor anything into this area. It's probably not really a half inch wide, but just to be conservative, I'm saying it is. And then the, uh, the picture frame's outer edge is along this line. Uh, so this whole area is covered up by frame. And then the actual stud, which is uh, about one and three quarters inch or thereabouts, uh, goes from about this point out this far. But I want the edge of the hinge to be, when it's folded over, to be right flush with the edge of the frame and that puts it about like this. So I've got this little area right here where I can drill a couple of new holes and put one or more screws through solid uh, wood into the stud and not be going through the soft area at all. Um, and then I've got this area here that I can also drill a hole in and put one more short screw into the actual wood of the side of the shadow box and then I'd have to cut off this extra piece of the hinge. But this area here will then anchor to the back of the frame. It doesn't need to be any wider than that. Um, and I think the frame width isn't that much difference, or different, if I can get my words to come out correctly. There it is. It is a wider um, pivot point on the hinge. Um, again, I don't want to bore anybody, but if I were to use this hinge there, uh, these two holes would certainly be able to go through into the stud and would probably do the job, but I'd really like to anchor it across a wider area for stability, and there's no way this edge is going to go anywhere except into soft uh, spackling and uh, right along the edge of the stud, which wouldn't be a very good place to anchor a screw. And it certainly wouldn't go far enough to go into the side of the shadow box. So I think this guy's out, and this is the closest I could find in the store, so that's what I'm going to use. I'm going to use my uh, routing fixture here on the Dremel tool to do a test fit of the hinge on a scrap piece of wood to make sure that I'm cutting the right depth uh, before I cut into the actual frame. Okay, here's my very crude uh, hinge countersink experiment. I've hogged this out very roughly with my Dremel tool and um, this is supposed to represent the frame and then the plate that goes against the wall folds up against it and you can see that only the plate sticks out beyond the frame itself and the edge of the pivot is flush with the edge of the surrogate frame. The idea here is that without moving the part that's screwed to the wall the frame should be able to go down almost flush with the wall only offset by that thickness of metal on the back part of the, <coughs> of the back part of the hinge and it uh, should be able to go completely vertical although not past that with that kind of a positioning so that's a proof of concept and there is a little bit of the hinge that'll be exposed at the edge of the frame but I think uh, everybody can live with that all right, I've modified the two hinges so they don't extend past the edge of the shadow box. There's a new hole for the shadow box wall. Um, one hole that's kind of iffy on the edge of the stud, and then one hole that's definitely into the stud. So at least two holes, maybe a third hole, depending how it goes. Uh, at least the uh, hinge is ready for it, and they're countersunk for the screws I'll be using. All right, the two hinge counter sinks are in there. Looks like they fit well. There's a little bit of slop around them for positioning. And then on the other side of the uh, frame, I've also put in two countersunk holes 
for these neodymium magnets that are going to get epoxied in there to uh, help hold this frame shut. I'll have to embed a washer or something in the wall for them to be attracted to. Okay, and now the hinges are mounted to the frame. And here a couple neodymium magnets are epoxied into their holes in the frame. To mate up with the magnets on the frame, I decided to just put a couple of screws through into the stud, um, and that is adequate for the magnets to attract to, and it's less conspicuous than trying to countersink a couple of washers or something. I think this will be better, and then I can paint over those. All right, and now the um, plexiglass or acrylic is put in there. And here the two handguns are positioned on their locks. And here's the completed visible gun safe.